Welcome to Conference Highlights, recorded in front of a live audience at an evidence-based perioperative medicine at EBPOM Conference. EBPOM are world leaders in perioperative education, so why not join us at our next meeting with a special discount for Top Med Talk subscribers. Look us up on www.ebpom, that's E-B-P-O-M, dot com. Top Med Talk. Professor Angela Coulter, we're really privileged to have Angela come to speak to us this morning. I advise you to look at her biography online because I haven't the time to go into all the areas that she's had impact in, but she's a senior health services researcher and policy analyst with a particular interest in patient and public involvement and shared decision-making, and she's here to talk to us about that this morning. Thank you, Angela. Thanks very much, Ramani. So my topic this morning is shared decision-making. And here's a definition in a report that Alf Collins and I published for the King's Fund. Clinicians and patients working together to select tests, treatments, management or support packages based on clinical evidence and the patient's informed preferences. Many of you will be familiar with the concept, but in case some of you aren't, it's important to recognize that What it's about is essentially a meeting between experts. The clinician, of course, has been to medical school for years and years and has amassed a great deal of experience on these things. The clinician knows about the diagnosis, the likely prognosis, etc. But the patient also has an important body of expertise which is not available to the clinician unless they have a good conversation about it. The patient and only the patient knows what it's like to experience the illness in their particular social circumstances. They and only they know about their values and preferences and attitudes to risk. So to make a good decision, that is if you have time, and of course there are some situations, emergency situations like some of the ones we were just hearing about where it isn't possible, Uh, time may preclude this kind of discussion. But where it is, and that is true of most medical decisions taken every day, the idea is that you should bring these two sources of expertise together And my colleague Al Mully has written a great deal about this, including another King's Fund report by him and his colleagues, which talked about the problem of misdiagnosis, the silent misdiagnosis. And they argued that if patients are unaware of the treatment options and outcomes, what's known about the risks and benefits, and indeed the uncertainties, and the clinician is unaware about the patient's preferences and values and attitudes to risk, then inevitably what you have is poor decision quality. So what we're talking about here is trying to improve the quality of clinical decision-making. And it's been discussed and indeed written about quite extensively over many years. And here's a simplified model of what the shared decision-making discussion, at least in theory, is supposed to involve. And one problem with this model is it looks a bit linear and it isn't always like that. But still, the patient needs to understand that there is a choice. And in most cases, there is a choice. Sometimes there's a choice between different treatment options. It may be even just a choice between two different drugs. It may be a choice between drugs or surgery and so on. It may be, and often it is, a choice between having an intervention and not having an intervention. So the patient needs to understand that. Then they need help to think through the various different options and what they might mean for them. And then they need a collaborative process in which together clinician and patient share information and make a decision. Now here's another way of presenting it. First of all, patients have got to be invited to participate. And for some patients, this may be quite surprising because we're all brought up to think that, you know, we go to the doctor, the doctor's the expert and the doctor makes all the decisions. But increasingly, that's changing And it needs to be explained to patients that their views are important. Then the options have to be presented, information on benefits and risks, a weighing up of those options, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. And the patient needs help to sort of deliberate, think through those options. And then finally, the clinician's job is to be responsible for making sure that whatever they've jointly agreed actually happens. 
Now, here's an example of the kind of trade-offs that are quite common, particularly in patients who may be scheduled or may be thinking about elective surgery. In many cases, I'm thinking about common operations like prostatectomy or hysterectomy. There are sometimes patients who know that these may well not be life-threatening conditions they're suffering from may need to be reassured that lifestyle changes might make a difference or medications alone, or indeed other interventions, or surgery. So this graph shows you the likely effectiveness of each of these, but we also know that the side effects tend to rise in proportion to the effectiveness. So sometimes patients have really quite complicated trade-offs to make, and they need time to think about these and to come to a reasonable decision in conjunction with the clinician. In many years of research into how to communicate risk, which is quite a challenge, especially since most patients will not have advanced statistical skills or even know how to weigh up probabilities. So a lot of studies have been done to try to work out what people can understand and what people can grasp easily. We know that it's really important to explain uncertainty, uh, that we can't absolutely predict what any individual patient is going to experience as a result of one treatment A or treatment B. We also know that although numbers may frighten people who have very basic mathematics, in fact, numbers work better than words. People interpret words like rare or quite common very, very differently. It's much better to back them up with some sense of numbers. We also know that natural frequencies are much better understood than relative risk. Relative risk really is misunderstood by many patients and indeed many clinicians too. And even percentages can be tricky for some people. We also know that using specific time frames is helpful. So this is likely to happen within a year or within six years or whatever it is. And using constant denominators are better understood than using constant numerators. So, you know, one out of 100, five out of 100, 50 out of 100 and so on. It's also helpful to use both positive and negative framing if you can. You know, one in a thousand patients will die as a result of this procedure, which means 999 will not die. Graphics can help, and I'll show you some examples. Where possible, individually tailored probabilities are much more useful than just what the average patient experiences. And it's also very helpful to make these risks more comprehensible by using everyday examples like crossing the road or winning a horse race or whatever it is. It's quite a complex process and we have various tools to help with this. This is an example to show patients with a moderate risk of cardiovascular events what the likely impact of taking statins will be. And you can see on this Kate's plot, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, the red Faces are the people who will have a cardiovascular event, but the majority of patients in this category won't. And that's important for people to understand. And then they can also see that the yellow faces are the people in whom a cardiovascular event will be prevented, but we also know that it won't be prevented in everyone who's at risk. So this is an aid to a discussion rather than just something to be presented to the patient completely cold without any discussion. We have now available quite a number of patient decision aids. This is one that I helped develop some years ago on prostatectomy or treatment options for enlarged prostate, which was an NHS project led by Mary Archer, who was then chair of Addenbrooke's. This one happened to be a leaflet and a DVD, and the DVD included films, clinicians explaining the pros and the cons and so on. But nowadays, they're much more likely to be online. Sometimes they're just simple one-page sheets that you can print out and put on the consulting table and talk about together. Others are meant for the patient to be given them and to go away and think about them and then come back. There are many different types. Here's one fairly simple, straightforward one about knee replacement surgery. And as well as presenting the probabilities and the risks and the pros and the cons, it also includes a tool to help patients think about what's most important for them. So somebody, for example, who's a keen gardener, needs to understand that after knee replacement, 
they may find it quite difficult to kneel down to do the weeding. That's a kind of important issue that they need to consider. So these tools help the patients to think through those sorts of things. Here's another example from breast surgery. This is for women in early stages of breast cancer. And the list of sort of things that patients might think about was derived from extensive research with patients thinking about this kind of decision. And it's quite a neat little online tool. The way scales kind of tip in one direction or another, depending on what things the patient decides to tick. And the idea is she can then go to see the surgeon, and the surgeon, or maybe it's the nurse or the anaesthetist, can see which way she's leaning. So she's leaning, in this case, her main concern is about the possibility of the cancer returning. So in her particular case, that looks like she's leaning towards mastectomy, whereas the alternative might be lumpectomy with radiotherapy. Now, the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston is one of the places where they've really pioneered this approach. As some of you may know, Mass General has also a large number of primary care practices attached to it. And they started in primary care. They've recently published a paper about their experience between 2005 and 2015. So that's the first 10 years of promoting shared decision making. And note the length of time. It has taken a long time to get this embedded into their system. So they started with 18 primary care practices who served about 200,000 patients. And they did a lot of work to encourage the clinicians to change the way they thought about medical decision making. They offered training, they invested in decision aids as part of their online system, so these are available online. They developed measures, I'll show you that in a minute, and they have seen a rapid rise in the use of these tools. So clinicians have found the decision aids to support shared decision making really useful, as have the patients. Mass General also has a research unit which is attached and which is supporting this work. And one of the things they've realized is that it's really important to get some kind of feedback, that the clinicians really want audit and feedback. Now they really want to do shared decision-making. They also want to know how they're doing. So they've developed a measure called the SDM Process 4 measure, or SDMP. It's just four questions. It's very simple, and you can see the questions there. It's really asking the patient, because these are patient-reported outcome measures, to report on how much they really really understood about the decisions they were facing and whether they felt involved. There are other questionnaires available, which I've also listed on the slide, and increasingly those are beginning to be used here too. The NHS England has a project working primarily at the moment with people working in musculoskeletal conditions where they're testing this approach around the country. We have got quite a lot of experience now from that work and also from work promoted by the Health Foundation who had a project called MAGIC. If you're interested in following it up, I do recommend going to the Health Foundation's website where there's a lot of useful tools and support. Now, we've had a push towards shared decision-making, and it's encouraging now that so many people are talking about it. The GMC has been arguing for it for a long time in good medical practice. They may not have used the term shared decision-making, but that's exactly what they're asking for. The Montgomery decision by the UK's Supreme Court, again, didn't use the term, but essentially what it was saying is that shared decision-making should become the norm. And patient groups have been advocating shared decision-making for quite some time, in particular National Voices, which is a coalition of about 150 patient organizations. So people have been calling for it, but we aren't doing very well yet in putting it into practice across the NHS. I used to be the chief executive of the Picker Institute, and the Picker Institute, among other things, develops and runs the NHS National Patient Surveys. And this results from 2002 to 2017 from the National Inpatient Survey, which every trust does every year. And you can see, although possibly there's a bit of an upward trend, these are people who said they were involved as much as they wanted to be in decisions about their care, but we're still only just over half. That means quite a high proportion of patients who've been in hospital would have liked to have had 
more say in their care. Now, some of the barriers are to do with attitudes among clinicians. Indeed, some of you in the audience may be thinking about some of these objections. Either that we do it already, and indeed, I'm sure some of you do, but often when people attend training courses, they suddenly realize that actually they don't quite do it. Others are worried about their patients wouldn't be able to cope with it, and so on. I want to reassure you that the research evidence suggests that most of those objections can be overcome if this is done well. There's a Cochrane Review. It's actually the most highly accessed Cochrane Review, I think, in the whole of the Cochrane Library. It includes data from 105 randomized trials. Um, This is particularly focusing on the use of patient decision aids. And it shows that it is certainly possible, if you do do it well, to improve patients' knowledge and understanding of the decisions they face and of the the treatment options that they may consider. They have, it leads to much more accurate risk perceptions that people involved feel more comfortable with the decisions they make. They're much more likely to participate with the clinician in making the right decision for them. And indeed, It also can lead to more conservative decisions with a small c um, because patients who understand the options often are more risk-averse sometimes than the clinicians who are advising them. Just an example of that. This is a trial that I was involved with really quite a long time ago. We published it in JAMA in 2002. This was in several hospitals in the West Country of England And it was women who were referred by their GPs because they had menorrhagia, heavy menstrual bleeding, for which at that time hysterectomy was the most common surgical treatment. Things have changed. And indeed, uh, hysterectomy for menorrhagia, I believe, is now on the list that NHS England has just published of the things we shouldn't be doing. But in those days, a very common operation, and this was the most common indication. So it was a three-arm trial, usual care, patients being given a decision aid in the second arm, and the third arm, patients being given a decision aid plus an opportunity for a good discussion about their options with a nurse. And you can see that costs were lowest in the decision aid plus discussion arm. The patients were much less likely to opt for hysterectomy when they understood about the alternatives. And what we reckoned we were intervening in was a kind of conveyor belt that patients had got onto. They'd been referred by a GP who might not have been terribly interested or knowledgeable about ways to treat menorrhagia, had referred the patient to gynae outpatients. The patients got to gynae outpatients and the gynecologist, who's a surgeon after all, assumed that the reason they were there was because they wanted surgery and nobody had intervened at all to tell the patients about the different ways of treating their condition. So when we did intervene, and this study was based in gynae outpatients, that was the result, that patients were less likely to want the most invasive treatment. So who benefits from this process? Well, this is my summary of research evidence to date. Patients are certainly better informed and they tend to receive more appropriate care when they're involved, when they're informed and involved. Interestingly, those patients with the lowest levels of health literacy tend to be those that benefit most. And when you think about it, that kind of stands to reason because they're likely to be the people who are least informed about their condition and treatments. And once you intervene, and especially if you can intervene in a really clear way and give them the kind of support they need, they benefit hugely from shared decision-making. Many clinicians who have changed their practice to practice this way say they would never go back. It's much more satisfying. They feel that they've had a much better consultation. It is true that shared decision-making consultations can take slightly longer. The Cochrane Review looked at the subset of studies where consultation time had been measured and found that on average the increase in time was about two minutes. But that increase paid off down the road because patients who were, had a better decision at that point and were more informed were much less likely to need follow-up consultations. So the initial consultation may need a little longer, but no reason to think that that's an impossible burden for the health service. 
I showed you the hysterectomy example, but there are plenty of other examples like that where we can feel confident that this leads to fewer unnecessary tests and interventions and treatments. And also, there's no evidence, well, there's limited evidence to support this, but it's worth bearing in mind, particularly in the light of Montgomery, that if patients are better informed, then they're much less likely to litigate if they're disappointed with the outcome. And indeed, in the US, this is now, there are several states, for example, Washington State, which is reassuring clinicians that if they can demonstrate that they've been through a good shared decision-making process, backed up with good evidence-based information from a decision aid, then that will be seen as protective. The reason there's not very much hard evidence on the impact of litigation is that it's incredibly hard to study. But also, of course, this may help to lower costs. That's something that is not the reason for doing this at all. And in some cases, it may increase costs because patients who are better informed may indeed choose the more invasive option. But for the NHS as a whole, it's one of the reasons why NHS England is promoting this approach. So if you're interested and if you want to learn more, just to tell you that under the auspices of Choosing Wisely UK, which is hosted by the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges, they're about to launch a new online training course. It's an adaptation of one that was developed in Australia and it's being adapted by a group at Cambridge, the Winton Centre at Cambridge. So I'm not quite sure when it's going to be launched, but it should be very soon and probably worth taking a look if you're interested. Thank you very much. Thanks for downloading and listening to Top Med Talk. Don't forget to find us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, even got our own YouTube channel. Whichever your favourite social media feed is, we're bound to be there. Find us. Also, subscribe to this podcast so that you never miss an episode. And make sure you go to the Top Med Talk website, topmedtalk.com get on board with the email updates oh whilst you're at it as well i suggest you download our entire back catalogue we're categorizing at the moment we're having a little look through it It may not always be in the form that you currently find it so if you get your hard drive ready for a full-on download via the website perhaps or perhaps through your podcatcher oh and if you fancy meeting us why not go to the website ebpom.org forward slash meetings Our next big event is EBPOM USA, the Dallas Masters course, a perioperative care practicum. Have a look for details of that and some of the other meetings coming up across the next year. EBPOM.org forward slash meetings.